My name is Martina, and this is Lois, and today we, with us we have the delightful Susan Chugula. She is a human rights activist, a lawyer, an advocate for the abolishment of death penalty. But she is also a former death row inmate that spent 16 years in Luzira Women's Prison in Uganda. Today she's most well known for being a prison reformer, as her case, Susan Chigula and 416 others versus the Attorney General in 2009 led to Ugandan law changes regarding the death penalty. Today we are very honored to have her on our stage here and we would like to discuss her personal story of Ugandan prison reform and her philosophy on punishment and retribution. <laughs> and redemption. Redemption, I'm sorry. Welcome. Susan, please join us on the stage. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to. You, oh, you can oh, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and have this conversation with us. How, how are you today? Um, I am very happy to be here today and looking forward to sharing my story. Yeah, to all of you. Um, so maybe we thought it would be nice to start off with your story a little bit. So over 20 years ago, you were convicted for the murder of your husband and put on death row, yeah. which meant that you could have been executed from any yeah. day onwards. Yeah. However, today we have the pleasure of sitting in front of you here, a room for discussion. Yeah. So I was wondering if perhaps you would like to share the story that brought you here. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for the platform. Um, I am from Uganda, it's a small country in the East Africa, and from a family of six children. My mom and, and dad um, got married when my mom was pretty young, 18 years, and then um, most of the time my dad had to stay with us when my mom had to go back to school. Um, when I was growing up, I was my daddy's favorite child, and because I was the first girl. So um, usually they say that dads are always um, more uh, attached to girls, to their daughters. <laughs> and when I was growing up, uh, we were not rich. Uh, my dad and my mom were primary school teachers. And they were not highly paid, but of course, they could manage to take care of the family. When I was around eight years to nine, my dad asked me, Susan, what do you want to be in life? And I told him that I want to be a banker. And um, he asked me why. Actually, he never asked me. It was up to me. Um, I wanted to be a banker because I thought that when you work in a bank, you have access to the large amounts of money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get that money to my dad so that he could be able to support our family because we were pretty struggling. And yeah, I, I looked at it and I wanted to do something for the family at such a young age. And um, when I was 16, I was not able to continue uh, for my studies because my dad was laid off work and my mom remained the only breadwinner, and I had my young siblings who also needed to go through uh, school. Can I have a glass of water? Of course. And then um, my, my parents sat me down and told me that Susan, we're unable to continue with your studies, thank you. Because um, we want also to uh, help your siblings to bring them up to at least a certain level of education. I had only finished my ordinary level, left with high school, then to university. Well, it was not present for me, but I had to accept because I was seeing the situation. And I looked at all my dreams crashing down and I didn't know what to do next. So. Um, when I was 16, 17, I went to the city to look for a job. And I got a job to work in a, uh, in a shop. 
And then I got a boyfriend, you know, I was now <laughs> kind of independent. And when I was 18, I, I, I got pregnant and I had my daughter. And then we started living with my boyfriend. Um, I would say, we were not married <laughs> legally, but of course, after the incidents, the media called him my husband. Fine with me. Um, yeah, so we started living together. We were a very young couple. We didn't have much, but we were happy because we had hope that we would, we would make it in life, you know. Yeah, and one fateful night, um, we went to sleep. We had dinner together. We were happy, and we went to sleep. But what woke me up was um, at around 3 a.m., it was a sharp instrument, a sharp cut on my neck. I didn't know what it was. And then I got up from the sleep and I ran out. But a, a sticky warm fluid was coming out of my neck. And I was collecting it and throwing it. And I was like, what has happened to me? And then it was blood. When I, I ran out, because the door was now wide open, and yet we had closed it when we were going to sleep. So I saw I was all covered in blood. And... I was badly cut, and this is the scar that you see from here up here. I had been badly, badly cut, and I called on to my husband, but he was not there. And then I fell down, and the next day I woke up in hospital. They took me to the hospital, and they told me that he died. He did not make it to the hospital, and I was um, badly cut, and... I survived narrowly. To be honest with you, I don't know the people who did it, and I don't know why. I did not delve so much into my husband's businesses or dealings, because I was pretty young. And I don't know why, because they never took anything from the house. I mean, yeah, they just came to take life. So after three days, um, I was very, very swollen, very sick. I could not um, support myself. I could only be supported by two people. And then after his burial, I was in pain. I've lost the man I loved, the father of my one-year-old daughter. I was already in pain of uh, having lost someone who understood me and who loved me dearly. And then I, I was also undergoing this physical pain. And then... My parents were taking me to hospital again for checkup when I was intercepted by the police. And the police said that they were arresting me because my in-laws are saying I am the one who killed him. And my dad asked them, but how come? Look at her. She cannot even walk or stand on her own. And the police said, we don't know, but they have brought the complaint to us, and so we are arresting her. And they questioned the police in this state that, yes, but how? We are supposed to take her to the hospital. And the police now, the policewoman started pulling me away from them. And my daughter was on the other side being carried by my sister, and she was crying, Mama. And uh, for, for the woman who was pulling me, the policewoman didn't care the state I was in, and they just pulled me away arrested me, they held me, and they dumped me in the police cells. I slept on the cement. But the good thing that I'm grateful about is that they allowed my father to take me to the hospital every morning for two months. The, the Police officers were also skeptical. They, they were looking at me. How could she have committed a crime in this state? Look at her. And they were always worried that I may die in the police cells as well. But of course, we were poor. My dad told me, one policeman asked him, give me some money, I'll release your daughter. 
and we are Christians. My dad told him, he held the Bible and told him, the God of truth will set her free. I don't have the money. And that police officer told my dad, you will go and eat your God, you will see. That means that corruption in my case started right at the police. So because my in-laws had money, I don't know why they hated me to this extent, really. I was a young girl. Yeah. And then after two months, I was taken to the court and charged with murder. <laughs> yeah, I was taken to prison, stayed in prison for two years before I was produced for trial in the court. I believed in my judicial system. I believed in the judges. When I was growing up, I never thought that anyone who was innocent would ever be taken to court. I always thought that those who are in prison have committed crimes. I also judged them harshly. And I believed even when I was growing up that judges are like gods. They can see through all lies. They can see through every person that is brought before them and they execute justice. Thank you very much. This is very helpful. And now, uh, I was very, very excited when I was informed that you're going for your trial. I knew at this moment that I'm going to get back my freedom. I did not expect anyone to come and falsely testify against me. Honestly, I even did not expect anybody to come up because I knew that I, I had not committed this crime. I mean, how on earth would one come and testify falsely against me? And then I was produced before the court. And the trial started... First witnesses came testifying falsely against me, but still their case was weak. I didn't have a lawyer of my own. The government gave me a lawyer whom I met that day for my trial who had not done any, any investigation about my case. He, if I had money, I would have paid for a lawyer who would do investigations, who would maybe produce witnesses in my defense, like, yeah, he would really do some groundwork for me. But because I couldn't afford one, and these lawyers were usually fine at the hearing date, I usually assigned many cases and paid peanuts. So they have to hurry up with the case. They don't do much across examination. They're not so really bothered. And so, um, lastly, he said they're bringing a child to testify against me. I was like, okay, which one? And they told me, your stepson, whom you are staying with. I was like, I, he, he, he's a baby, and they just woke him up in the morning when everything had, even when they had even taken me to the hospital. They, they woke both children up. They were covered in blood, but they continued sleeping because they are children. They didn't know what was happening. And so how was that child who was asleep throughout all the ordeal going to testify against me? And how? I mean, he's three years. He was three years then. And to my surprise, because my in-laws had this child in their custody for those two years I was in prison, I think they were able to manipulate him and tell him, few words to say to the judge. Tell the judge you saw how she killed. And that's what the child said. But I have nothing against that child because he's a child that was used to, <laughs> to say things that he did not see. And 
when I came out, I heard that uh, he's looking for me. He wants to see me because he's carrying a heavy burden on his heart. He was forced to say something that he did not see. I, I have no problem with that child from my heart. And then judgment day came and the, I was still very expectant because I trusted in the judge. I trusted in our judicial system. Not knowing that a lot of bribery had taken place. And the judge said, Susan, Higula, I find you guilty of the offense of murder. And therefore, I sentence you to suffer death by hanging. It was a joke. What? Death. Guilty? I went numb at that moment. I didn't know what to think. It was like a huge building was collapsing on me. I did not believe my ears. I was living in denial. How? I mean, how? What have you said? I mean, what? It is impossible. But then it was that the judge had sentenced me to suffer death. He had found me guilty. Yet I was innocent. I was taken to the death row section. where I met so many women who were in my situation. They were all crying for their children. I had left out my one-year-old child. All my future goals. My future had come to an end. And my baby, my baby, how was she going to grow up without me? And then other women were also crying. Who were very helpless. I was very angry with God. How could he allow such an injustice? to happen to me. Most of the women were innocent and the minority who were guilty, who had committed those crimes, did not deserve really to, to die because they had committed those crimes in self-defense, you know. They've been living in abusive marriages for so long and their husbands kind of were raping them, sexually abusing them, battering them. And in the process of those fights in the home, you know, the husband dies, not intentional uh, killing. And to my analysis, none of us deserve to be on death row. So after a few months and a year went by, I just decided to, to forgive. Because I knew that maybe God has a reason why he's allowing me to go through this. And also, I forgave because it was good for me. I, I got tired of being in this situation of being angry, bitter, resentful. I just made a decision to forgive. Even though no one had asked for forgiveness, I have forgiven. And I realized that it was for my good because to me, um, peace is better than being right. I needed peace in my heart. And looking at these helpless women, I needed to do something for them. So after realizing that most of them had not even understood their court proceedings. So I started a school in prison to help these women get some formal education. And in that school, I also start, started studying again for my advanced level. And after two years, I was able to uh, graduate from high school in that prison school. 
And then I was among the best in the country. We didn't have classes. We were studying under trees. We didn't have teachers. We were doing it ourselves. When it rains, you have to brave the rain. When it shines, you have to stay. Yeah, and then I was ready for high school, for university, sorry. And then that's when um, a gentleman, McLean Alexander, he's a British lawyer, who had, been, who had been coming in prison to support us in one or the other, setting up a library. So he told me, Susan, I've got your scholarship to study from the University of London. I was excited. Okay, what am I going to study? And he told me, no, no, not me. Because I had already suffered in the hands of law. I didn't want to do law. I hated law altogether, the judges, the courts, and the lawyers. I told him, you go back, get me another course. He went back. And then when he came back, the University of London had sent me boxes and boxes of books with my identity card. And he told me, McLean told me, Susan, you've been enrolled at the University of London on a diploma course. You're going to study for law. Um, I was like, law again? No. I told you. And he told me, Susan, I've seen what you're doing with the women. And if you study law, you're going to help yourself and others. So I took it up under very harsh conditions and same challenges. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have internet. I didn't have lecturers. I was determined this time and said, okay, let me study law and try to help myself and others. And that's how I was able to graduate with a, law, uh, with a diploma in law. And then the scholarship was extended for me to study for a law degree, which I did. And I graduated and I'm now a lawyer. I used that legal knowledge to help my fellow prisoners with their legal uh, issues in legal representations because they are poor, they cannot afford lawyers. So I could train them in self-representation, write for them appeals and submissions, prepare their defenses. And I saw many getting justice, many were sentenced to lesser sentences and others were released. So I saw that uh, my legal um, career had impacted highly in their lives. And I also led a death penalty petition Susan Chigula 417, other death row inmates in Uganda, a famous case that changed the laws of Uganda. In that case, we were contending against the death penalty altogether in its context, mandatory death sentences, the manite is carried out, and the long stay in, on death row. And was successful that the mandatory death sentences were abolished in Uganda, and that meant that all the 417 death row inmates were off the hook. So right now, as I speak, no one is still on death row. Majority of them have left prison, and this changed the laws of Uganda. And also, long stay on death row before one is executed has been brought to three years. So in three years, if after uh, finishing your appellate courts, if you are not... Uh, executed, you're supposed to be automatically transferred to life imprisonment. And of course, the state, um, the government appealed against it because they know they cannot kill people every other time. That means they're going to be executing every year. And we've not had executions in Uganda for more than now 10 years. And that gave us hope because if the government itself is afraid of executing you know, people, that means that uh, um, they know it's wrong. It's wrong to have the death penalty, just that they want it to stay as a scarecrow to maybe um, a political uh, opponent or maybe to think that it's a deterrent to crime. But of course, uh, we don't have evidence to prove that it's a deterrent. So I am here to implore you, um, my dear friends, um, always know that um, not everyone who is in prison is, is really um, guilty. Um, I know you, you don't have the death penalty in your country, but um, as young leaders of tomorrow, I want to implore you not to ever be tempted to reinstate it. You never know, because right now, if we carry out an opinion poll, I know that highest percentage would say we want it. But it's not a deterrent. It's inhuman. It's degrading, because in Uganda, it's carried out by hanging. 
a rope is pulled until when you die. And some instances, the heads fall off, blood gushes all over, going to the cells of those who are still waiting for their fate. So it's just a horrible sight. And how about the innocent ones? Because it's better to keep people in prison. And once they are proved to be innocent, they can come out of the prison. But you can get someone out of the prison, but not out of the grave if you had killed them. So suppose I had been killed, I wouldn't be here to share my story with you. I came out of prison in 2016, um, January, and since then I've been uh, traveling all over the world, uh, speaking to uh, young people, older people, parliamentarians. And um, of recent I was in Paris in France, and I spoke with the president of France, Macron, were together. And so I'm spreading this message of the abolition of the death penalty. Um, I'm a human rights act activist and trying to bring many reforms in prisons. Thank you for listening to me. And maybe something that I have not told you is what I'm doing right now. Um, we'll get back we'll to get that. We'll get there. Yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that yep. very, very inspiring story. Um, it was very moving to, mm. to listen to it and also... It's very impressive that you were able to go from death row to someone actually working on the steps to abolishing death penalty. In, Thank in you. Thank you. It's not easy to. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not easy for me to to share my story, mm -hmm. but because I know that it has to uh, make positive impact to other people, I do share it. We're very thankful for for you doing well, here today, and we would like to open up. The floor to some audience questions if they're, you're ready, and if not, we'll move on. Um, we have a microphone <laughs> coming. <laughs> okay. So uh, my first question is uh, about, you said that you were uh, studying in University of London, but I would like to ask, how did you manage to go from Uganda to UK? Thank you very much. I actually managed to go from Uganda to the UK through my tree, which was my class. <laughs> um, I, I studied from the University of London on a distant program. I, I didn't have to go to, to London because I was still a prisoner by then. So uh, the university could send me all the study materials and I had to study on my own. Um, I was sent... Um, an mp3 player which had brief introductions to different topics i could listen to it before i delve into a topic mm. and then i had to read extensively to understand the legal concept or concepts it actually helped me because i think it built my analytical skills as a lawyer because i di i knew that i i didn't have to depend on anyone a cosmate so i had to do it on my own Yes, so that's how I, I managed to study. Thank you. Yes. He has a second there question. There is a second question, yes. Uh, so my second question is, uh, so you said that, um, for example, uh, if we take Uganda, mm. you are against uh, death penalty. Mm. But, for example, if we are talking about such country as the US, where death mm. penalty is also legal, mm. uh, do you think that it should be a band also there, or taking into account the fact that, of course, the uh, U.S. Uh, legal uh, court is uh, probably of higher quality than uh, Orgadian one, it should, be, uh, it should say as it is now. Thank you very much. Um, apparently, in Uganda, we still have a death penalty in the law books. Though um, now what came out of that court case is that mandatory death sentences or automatic death sentences. What do I mean? If one is found guilty of any capital offense, murder inclusive, now the judge has the discretion to sentence um, the offender to any, um, to any sentence they feel fit for that crime. Unlike before, where, wherever you would be found guilty, whether you, you may be, for example, killed someone who was raping you, it was automatic. They would automatically sentence you to death. But today, 
um, circumstances of the commission of the offense are put into consideration. So we still have the death penalty in Uganda in our law books because the judges held that it was not in their powers to scrap it out of our law books and guided the legislators, uh, members of parliament, on which rules, laws they could um, employ to, um, of course, scrap it off. But of course, we, uh, we need the will of the, uh, the leaders, the will of the leaders to abolish the death penalty in Uganda. So in the US, yes, um, US still has the death penalty in some uh, states. I would still say um, I'm not only advocating for the abolition of the death penalty in Uganda. My, um, my movement, my struggle is against the death penalty all over the world. Yes, and still I would say the U.S. should still abolish the death penalty. Though we have cultural differences between Uganda and the U.S., but you find that still most people on death row in the U.S. are the poor people who cannot afford lawyers, um, and majority are black people. I, I, I think, I, to me, it's not about race, but it's because most black people are poor people. Yes, yeah, so they, they don't have uh, that powerful uh, legal presentation in, in their court cases. And then still we have seen and we have witnessed many uh, miscarriages of justice uh, in the U.S., uh, yes. And so I, Jan Banning is working on Christina Boyer's story, and he's releasing a, a book soon, the, the verdict. She's an innocent woman who was uh, wrongfully sentenced and forced to plead, uh, to take a guilty plea. So many have been forced to take guilt pleas because they, they fear for their lives. So still, we have miscarriages of justices all over the world. So the death penalty, to me, is a no for all countries. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your questions so far. So, as we kind of um, established, the a constitution for Uganda allows for death penalty under Article 22, but because of the constitutional petition uh, led by your case, now judges have more legal discretion and judicial yep. discretion for punishments. I was personally wondering, why was it that it was your case that spearheaded the death penalty project? Why was it season, Susan Chigula and 416 others? Um, of course, um, why me or my case? Um, I think it's not my case that spearheaded the petition. Um, my case, of course, was looked at as something that had several miscarriages of justice. And yeah, but of course, um, the fact that I led the petition is because um, as a woman, I was actively involved in this, um, in this struggle, in this movement. So yes, this is why I had to lead that case as, as a person. But of course, it is a collective effort. I was a prisoner and I would not file uh, affidavits when I'm in prison. So I needed some external support. And we had lawyers also. We had the European Union to support us. We had Foundation for Human Rights um, and other um, pressure groups to support us. Um, not only you, but a lot of people got their sentences, got a retrial and got their sentences revoked, uh, got put off the death penalty. There were also people that were still in the end executed, like you mentioned before, the last ex execution in Uganda was 2003. But do you think that not everyone was, um, was able to get their death penalty revoked? I beg your pardon? I need to... Why didn't, why wasn't everyone able to, after your case, so mm. Susan Chigula mm. and 417 others, mm. um, why were there still people executed after that? Oh, so just the death. Okay, after, after 2009, when the final judgment came out, we, we've not had executions, but we've had stubborn judges who continue to sentence people to death. Mm. However much the judgment stipulated that it should be applied in the realist of rarest of cases. But of course, you know, um, some judges take some cases so personal because they have all the authority, I mean, to decide. Yeah, they do decide. But since that judgment, we've not had executions, but we've had 
some instances where some people are sentenced to death. And speaking of this kind of judicial discretion, um, there are also some inconsistencies nowadays with the retrials, uh, mm. so I've heard. So mm. some judges take into account time served, mm -hmm. some don't take into account mm. time served, some take into account medical and social histories, mm -hmm. and some don't. Do you, what, what do you think about this inconsistency of the judges uh, in the retrials? Um, some, like I've said, that at times, you may find that you, you're before a judge who woke up on the wrong side of the bed, yeah. you know, and he just feels like he's not happy, he's not happy that day, he's not happy with you, he's not happy with everybody. So don't bother me, just have this sentence, a harsh one. But of course, if um, a judge is very reasonable and puts into consideration all the mitigating factors presented to him, um, there is no point why you would be you would behave like you you're the executor. Yeah. And I guess um, one of the important things in a fair trial is having some legal consistency. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. knowing what what you can expect. And important is fair representation, which was something that uh, you struggled with because mm -hmm. of the uh, yeah not professionalism mm -hmm. of the lawyer mm -hmm. you were awarded because I mean he didn't even know the facts of your case mm -hmm. and the star witness in your case was also some it was it was a it was your three-year-old stepson's memories and I think that definitely puts in question the due process in in Uganda mm -hmm. do you have hope for that due process becoming increasingly better in the future mm, um, to me I always believe in positivity and looking at where we are now, um, I still hope that things are going to get better as years go by. Yeah. Um, of course, right now, um, you find that um, there are so many inconsistencies in, in trial courts. And um, at times, you, you find that judges are very adamant and are not ready to redress readdress themselves on certain issues just because they want to cover up uh, their mistakes. But I do have hope that in the future things will change. We'll have a new breed of judges, of lawyers, who will be um, independent in their decisions and who will look at things in a different perspective. Yeah. I'd like to take a step back from the more logistic questions. I want to go a little bit further into your philosophies on death penalty. So you mentioned before that you are against death penalty globally. Mm -hmm. But do you think that there are specific instances, mm -hmm. there are actions or people in which cases an execution is justified? Um, I know that we are all human beings who are bound to make mistakes. And I know there are so many people who have made mistakes and the law has not caught them. And so many people have done so many wrong things and they've gotten away with it. First of all, I don't think there is any execution that should be justified because um, we should first tackle the reasons as to why that uh, particular person committed that crime. And to have we given opportunity for this person to change? Or for him or her to come to terms with what he or she did? Because by executing, you're robbing the society of the opportunity of, um, of changing this person who belongs to the society. You are robbing the country. The country itself should not be... Um, a, a, a murder a state. Like, we should not involve ourselves as a country in bloodshed. We should be exemplary to the citizens. Executing people means that we are showing the public that revenge is right. And so for me, I do believe that everyone has an opportunity and a capacity to change for better 
we should not rob these people of the opportunity of asking for forgiveness and also preaching to the others that what they did was wrong. Because by executing that person, there may be other people still doing the same thing. And may the state kill is the question. So, so would you say a sentencing should aspire to rehabilitate rather than punish? But what about the victim and the victim's families? Oh, yes. Um, I, I really am not condoning crime. I'm not saying that um, people who commit crime should be let free. No. They should be punished. But the punishment should be rehabilitative. And the victims of families, I, I really feel for them. And we should also give them an opportunity of forgiving. Because if you execute everyone who wrongs you, I mean, when will you ever forgive? I've shared my story that I forgave even when no one asked me. For, for their own peace of mind. Maybe they need to forgive that person. And if you do away with them quickly, these people may in the end regret like never going to, to forgive those people for their own sake, uh, peace of mind. So um, I do believe that even the victims' families, uh, we need to give them time to heal as we keep this person in prison. And le uh, later... Um, Give them the chance to decide what they want to do with their souls after what they've gone through. Yes. You, you speak a lot of forgiveness and also about your religion. So growing up Christian mm -hmm. um, and how God helped you also through your yeah. time in prison. Yeah. Could you link also your spiritual and religious morals to your fight against the death penalty? Mm, yes, in a way that... Okay, I've had people who say that a knife for a knife, those who want the death penalty, and a knife for a knife, and they are um, pulling this quote from the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. But when you read the Bible clearly in the New Testament, and you're following what Jesus said, Jesus said, forgive. And when you're saying uh, our Father, prayer, the Lord is prayer, we, we pray that forgive us as we have forgiven those who who do wrong to us. So, um, if you're telling me that you're following the Old Testament of a knife for a knife, how about when Jesus himself came and said, forgive, just like I've forgiven you. That means that everyone has sinned. Everyone has, has sinned against God. So, it's just the grace of God that helps us to be forgiven. So, for me, I'm saying that let us embrace the word forgiving or forgiveness. Because we are also we have been forgiven too much. <laughs> we've done too many thing, wrong things. And we've been forgiven all the time. So why don't we forgive? Yeah. And forgiveness was also a big part of your uh, resentencing. So during your retrial, a big focal point was the moment you said sorry to the family of your deceased husband. What did that sorry at that moment meant for you? Um... For me, when I said sorry to them, um, I think the media misinterpreted it. I, was, I, I, I actually said I'm sorry for what happened to all of us. Mm. But you know, because at times the media want to take just one thing out of it, uh, they, they, they just pulled out the so Yes, I said I'm sorry. I feel so sorry for what happened to all of us. Because I knew they had been going through pain as much as I've been going through pain. Of course, losing someone is not something that one can take so easily. And so I wanted to put myself in their shoes. This is why I forgave them. Because I realized, okay, maybe they were in too much pain and they were blinded by the pain and accused me. But of course, that, that doesn't justify the fact that they had to go to extreme extents of bringing this child, training this child. But still I forgave. So when I say, um, Martina, I'm sorry for what you're going through. Oh, I'm sorry for what we have been going through. It doesn't mean that I'm saying, no. I'm sorry, I, I hurt you. I'm sorry. Well, if I've hurt you, then yeah, it's okay for me to say it. But we have all been going through a lot, a lot of hell. And I, I just wanted them to know that I have nothing against them. I have nothing, no problem with them.
Yeah, and, and from what you were saying, the media very much blew it up uh, from proportion. In previous talks, you've always also spoken about the stigmatization that happens when prisoners uh, go out into the public again in Uganda. And there seems to be this public sentiment in Uganda um, that is pro-death penalty, which I've uh, read about. And I was wondering why you think Uganda had a mandatory death penalty in the first place, and why is it so hard to change now? Um, one thing we have to be aware of is Uganda is a, British, a former British colony, and the laws that we are operating on were enacted by the British. And I think that is uh, one of the laws that they never paid, paid attention to. And that's why it was ongoing. Yeah, until when they realized and when they researched that, hmm, what are we doing? This is not right. Yeah, and um, uh, talking about the stigmatization of ex-prisoners, I think it's, it's everywhere because uh, basing on all the countries that I've traveled to and meeting uh, many former, formerly incarcerated people, men and women, they all tell me the same thing, that they, they are stigmatized. They find it difficult to find a job. And at times they are rejected by their own people, their own families. So it's not only in Uganda. Though in Uganda, being that uh, it's a poor country, uh, it's worse because um, one uh, needs to uh, get back on their feet again. And jobs themselves are not there, even for those who are not in prison, you know. Yes, so we have a very high number of unemployment or unemployed uh, young people in, in Uganda. And so if you come and you've been in prison, and if others are not getting jobs, they're not there, how about you? So what uh, 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 I do is try to um, support these women who have been in prison for so long to um, make sure that uh, their reintegration is a little bit easier, but it's not easy. We'll get there as to what I do. Next to Uganda, there's, there's more countries in the world, of course, that still carry out, uh, that still have a death penalty yes. illegally. Mm -hmm. Um, and the African Union is a union where it's actually relatively prevalent. So out of the 54 states in African Union, um, 16 have abolished the death penalty, mm -hmm. but 21 have a moratorium, so it's mm -hmm. kind of similar mm -hmm. to, to what Uganda has, and 17 still retain the death penalty. Why do you think it's still so prevalent in the African Union? Mm, I think African Union needs um, to do a lot. Um, if it believes in it, that's it. And um, I do think that also African Union leaders should not be substandard. Mm. They should come out openly and and show where they do belong. Yeah, instead of think or thinking that you're going only to come together for economical reasons, for political reasons, there are certain issues that we need to address. And uh, why, how come that some states have abolished, and you find that uh, most states which have abolished the death penalty are form formally, uh, were formerly colonized by the French. Mm. And because France doesn't believe in a death penalty, it has highly influenced those states to abolish the death penalty. And this goes back to Britain. Uh, Britain uh, formally uh, colonized other countries, and you are going to find, if you research that, most of the retentionist countries in Africa were formerly uh, colonized by the British. And Britain also enacted those laws. And Britain has not come up to also tell them, please, we did this, but we no longer believe in it, um, influence the abolition of the death penalty in those countries. Do you think they still should do that today? They should do it. They should do Why? Why are they quiet? Because like, they should borrow leave from France. Yes. So, um, do you I think, think it should be a global effort then? It, it must, not should, it must be a global effort. Yes, this is something that we need to do all together globally. Today you're in Holland. You may find yourself tomorrow working in Uganda or in any other a retentionist country and you find yourself in trouble with the law and you end up on death row, you know? So this must be a global fight.
And looking towards the future and kind of in a, in a hopeful way, um, you also do a lot of activist work. Uh, so how does your work with the African Prison Project and the Sunny African Children look like? Okay, um, with the Sunny African uh, Children Center, um, we take care of children of prisoners, street children and orphans. Out of these children, we pick them from the streets and others we, we go and get them from different homes in the countryside or in the villages um, when uh, their families or their parents uh, inform us that um, they left them to nobody. Um, when I was in prison, I realized that uh, most children of prisoners have nobody to take care of them because the government doesn't have any policy to take care of those children. So when I came out, I took it upon myself to start looking for those children because most of them had ended up on the streets, were homeless, were not going to school, and others were committing crimes and ending up in juvenile prisons. Others were, um, of course, exposed to human trafficking and child labor, and others were sexually abused by even their own relatives. So, so many evils were ongoing with these children, and so uh, that's why I came up to... Um, help uh, give a new life to these children. And so um, how is it related with the justice defenders? Um, I work with justice defenders on, on a um, part-time basis, but what we do is we go into prisons and we train prisoners and prison staff. Um, in legal, uh, we give them legal information. We give them legal information. We equip them with the basic legal information which can be used to help other prisoners who come in prison every day. Um, they are the ones who are with them. They are the ones who remain with them. So uh, prisoners who are not able to afford lawyers go to these legal aid clinics. We open up in the prisons, and then uh, they get information about their cases, and they are guided through their cases, and they are able to to do self-representation mm. in, in courts. So that's what we do. But still, I have also another uh, law firm that I work with, and it's a group of lawyers from actually different law firms, and we still do uh, give uh, legal representation to, um, to prisoners who have uh, high-profile cases and uh, unable to afford lawyers. And when you look at those cases which have been escalated by the media, you see that these people are really innocent, but just because uh, their cases have been blown out of proportion. So we also help them, yeah, because we do encourage other lawyers to give pro bono services. Well, it's very beautiful work you're doing currently. And Thank you. before we would like to end this interview with our last question, we would open up the audience, the, the floor for the audience to ask uh, questions again. Thank you. Um, should I get up? Um, so you were you were talking about um, there should be still consequences for the people who caused harm to their communities, but rather um, the punishment should be more uh, like a rehabilitation process. So I was wondering. Is it possible for us to imagine a world, a better, a just world without prisons and without mass incarceration or prison industrial complex like in the U.S. where a lot of prisoners subjected to exploitation of their labor and like inhumane tra treatments? And, um, and you also shared your own story and probably you, ha you have heard other stories of incarcerated women in prison. So that's, that's kind of my question. Like, are we able to imagine a world without prisons eventually and um, find solutions to those who cause hard harm to their communities without policing or like incarceration or that penalty as well. Thank you very much. Um, of course that depends on the, on the crime committed. Uh, we have what we call community community sentences, uh, whereby um, offenders um, are sent in the community and 
they can do some work, maybe cleaning in hospitals. That is also an alternative to imprisonment. But that can only be done to people who have committed uh, minor offenses. But to people who commit serious crimes, it is very difficult for, for the governments, for, for the system to let them, you know, in the public. Because um, they may be lynched, you know. And also keeping them away for some time is good for them also, whether guilty or not. Because it's good for, for them to also reflect on what they did. You know, it is, that reflection is very important for a human being. Because if, for example, you just let them free, um, maybe you'll be uh, bringing more harm to the society. But of course, um, I'm saying that we should have rehabilitative uh, sentences where people can go to prison, be rehabilitated, and then uh, when we see that they are ready to come back to the society, we release them back to the society. It would have served the purpose of justice. Of course, there is a lot of exploitation of labor, not only in the U.S., but in other uh, prisons in different countries. And uh, that is something that we are trying to address as well. But of course, some, um, some prisons um, call it rehabilitation, but of course, for their own benefit. But we are still continuing to address that problem. Well, any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> hi, thank you. Um, so my question is, you mentioned there are many women who were in the prison because of uh, family abuse. So I was curious about how many judges in Uganda at that time was female and how the gender discrimination or gender plays into more women. <clears throat> and in family situations were being uh, put into prison. Like, uh, it's unfair for most women who are sexual abused in the family to get into prison or death penalty. So just curious how gender plays into this. Yeah. Um, I did not understand properly, but I think I'll answer you. Um, how many female judges were? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, still this distribution of of labor and roles is still <laughs> a problem. I think not only in my country, but other countries, you know. <laughs> so here. Yeah, so uh, we have very few female judges in Uganda. But what is surprising that you find that a female judge is very harsh on a, on a female prisoner. <laughs> and that baffles me, you know. Um, you find that uh, this female, female uh, judge does not even want to put herself in the position of this prisoner. And at times you find that male judges sympathize with their male counterparts. For example, a man is brought before a judge and he um, he's uh, accused of maybe raping his wife repeatedly. And the judge would say, excuse me, where on earth do you find a man raping his wife in Africa? Yeah, you see, um, because uh, he's now looking at it as caricature that men have uh, that, um, how can I call it? Um, men are supposed to get whatever they want from their wives. So a woman is not supposed to deny anything from the man. Like, uh, yeah. So um, you find that a, a judge also uh, sides with the man, but then you find that a female judge at times does not understand. I, for myself, during my appeals, I went before a female judge and she was very harsh on me. I couldn't believe, uh, may she rest in peace, she is now gone. But I wondered, and it gave me more courage to start the law because I, I wanted to, I, I knew what these women are going through, and I felt it for them. But I was wondering why this, this highly ranking judge could not really understand my plight. So we have a few of them, but we need to educate them about the plight of women. Another question. Hi, so I just wanted to question, did you ever question your faith during the time that you were incarcerated? And has, I know you said that you've done a lot to help um, women in general, but when your faith was tested, did, was there ever a time you felt like giving up? 
Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I questioned my God. I questioned him so many times. And when I was sentenced to death, I felt like he does not exist. And I actually got angry with him, you know. Yeah, it is understandable. But then later on, when I started um, living through uh, all that I was going through and understanding, I knew that uh, there is no way I'm going to survive without my God. And as a believer, I, I knew that I, I didn't have to question him so much. I just need to trust him. And so my relationship with God came back. So, um, yeah, at one point still, when you really pushed on the wall, you question his existence. And it's absolutely normal. But, of course, I got back and now I have a very wonderful relationship with God. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story, first of all. And um, I was very impressed by when you mentioned how you were able to forgive uh, your relatives. And um, I think my question is how you believe this forgiveness and this ability to forgive others or understand the position of others should maybe be introduced more into a legal system and whether judges or lawyers should be more trained in empathy and um, also how and whether this has a role in legal training. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're right. Lawyers and judges should be trained so much in empathy. But I think even before one is trained, because no one trained me to forgive, um, most especially in my country, most people know God. Because we have Muslims, they believe in God. We have Christians, yeah. And uh, few who are, very few who don't believe. But um, I, I do believe that uh, one is one's uh, upbringing matters so much because everybody has to have that humanity in them. You, you, no one should come and train you to be humane. It has to be in you. You must know that human beings are human beings, and you must know how to treat a human being. But of course, yes, um, I think we need to carry out some trainings. Um, we have a, a Christian Lawyers Association in Uganda, which is trying so much to bring in more uh, lawyers and uh, to try and make them understand that at times when you don't know what to do, you should always maybe pray, maybe consult your God, maybe you should also look at this case in, in a humane way and also um, analyze for yourself, not for only from the books you read, not only from the constitution you have, but also question your heart. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for answering all our lovely audience questions. And we would lastly like to ask you, what we, can we expect from you in the future? Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you also for uh, having invited me and welcoming me here today. Um, oh, what do you expect me from the future? <laughs> I would say that um, I'm going to be... Um, a great leader. <laughs> Expect that, yeah. Um, I'm looking at it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, the audience. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. A big applause for our guests.